Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. On the morning of April 10th, 1997, a man named Jeffrey Smith woke up in his room at the Doubletree Hotel, located at Broad and Locust Streets in the heart of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Though a native of Massachusetts, the 51-year-old corporate lawyer was in town for a three-day work event which was put on by the Northeast Pharmaceutical Conference, an organization of primarily New England-based pharmaceutical researchers and executives, which Jeffrey represented. Noticing that his 50-year-old wife, Judy, was still asleep, Jeffrey got out of bed quietly so as not to disturb her. Unlike him, she wasn't involved in the pharmaceutical conference, so there was no need for her to wake up just yet. With a bit more time still to go before the day's scheduled event started, Jeffrey decided to head downstairs to the hotel's main floor to take advantage of the complimentary breakfast that was provided. He finished up shortly before 9 a.m., after which he returned to his room to grab what he needed for the day. Upon entering the room, Jeffrey was greeted by the sounds of the shower running. Judy had gotten up in his absence and was now also getting ready to start her morning. Unlike Jeffrey, though, Judy's day was going to be filled with taking in the sights. It was her first time in Philadelphia, and she planned to hit as many of the local tourist attractions as possible. After going into the bathroom to say good morning to Judy, Jeffrey told her that she should try the hotel breakfast before heading out, because it was actually pretty decent. Judy joked that she would go right that minute, still soaking wet and unclothed from her shower. The two shared a laugh and went over their plans for the day once again. Jeffrey was scheduled to monitor a few of the conference's sessions that day, but would be done by the late afternoon. Judy rattled off a list of places she might visit that day in the meantime, including Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. They would meet back up at the hotel when Jeffrey was done and head to the conference's cocktail party for 6 p.m. With that, Jeffrey left the room and went on his way. Little did he know, though, that this seemingly innocuous encounter would be the last that he would ever have with his wife. In the intervening hours, Judy would abruptly disappear, leaving behind little more than a bizarre series of unconfirmed and conflicting witness sightings. The mystery would only deepen when a horrific discovery was made, several months later and several hundred miles away. This is the unsolved case of Judy Smith. Before we get to the main part of today's story, if you find our videos interesting and informative, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel, and if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Alright, with that out of the way, let's get to the video. When Judy Bradford met Jeffrey Smith, Neither of them were necessarily looking for love. They were both in their early 40s and were the divorced parents of adult children that they had reportedly more or less raised themselves. Judy, in particular, had been unlucky in her previous relationships. She had been married twice before, with her first husband leaving her behind and fleeing the country to avoid the military draft for the Vietnam War, and her second husband leaving her jobless to raise their two children by herself. Resilient and independent, Judy had more than risen to the occasion, and worked and supported her kids while also putting herself through nursing school, eventually becoming a home health care nurse. It was this job that would cause her to cross paths with Jeffrey Smith. In 1986, Judy began working as an in-home care nurse for Jeffrey's father, who was recovering from throat surgery. The successful lawyer was impressed by how dedicated Judy was to her job, and was drawn to the kindness she showed his father. As the two began to get to know each other more, a deeper connection started to form, and they learned that they had a number of things in common. Not only were they both parents, but they were both passionate about the medical field, albeit Jeffrey was more on the legal side. Soon, Jeffrey asked Judy out, and the two began dating, enjoying regular outings to things like plays and basketball games. Though Jeffrey and Judy's relationship steadily became more and more romantic in nature, the couple decided not to rush things, and dated for seven years before finally moving in together in Newton, Massachusetts. It would be another three years before they were married in the fall of 1996. 
Sources seem to disagree on when this wedding was exactly, with roughly half of the reports we came across from the time saying September and the other half saying November. Regardless, after ten long years, by all accounts, Judy and Jeffrey were very much in love and seemed excited to spend the rest of their lives together. Tragically, neither of them knew just how brief a time this would be. Just a few months after tying the knot, Jeffrey and Judy decided to take what was to be one of their first real trips as a married couple. As part of his work representing the Northeast Pharmaceutical Conference, Jeffrey needed to travel to attend the annual event, which that year was being held in Philadelphia from April 9th to the 11th. Since for the most part, Jeffrey only really needed to be at the conference during the day, they decided that it would be fun for Judy to come along too. As she had never been to Philadelphia before, it would give her an opportunity to see the sights during the day while still allowing her and Jeffrey to enjoy their evenings together. To round out the trip, the couple decided that once the conference was over, they would spend the following weekend visiting friends in New Jersey before heading back home to Massachusetts. So it was that early on the afternoon of April 9th, 1997, Jeffrey and Judy Smith arrived at Boston's Logan International Airport to catch their flight to Philadelphia. Much to the couple's chagrin, however, they ran into problems after getting to the airport. As while checking in for their flight, Judy realized that she had forgotten to bring her driver's license. Without a form of identification, Judy would not be allowed to board the flight, but by the time she realized her mistake, there wasn't enough time for her to go home and grab her license while still making it back in time to catch the flight. Knowing that Jeffrey needed to be in Philadelphia for the first part of the conference that afternoon, Judy told her new husband to go on without her. She said that she would head back and grab her ID and would board a flight to Philadelphia later on. According to reports, Jeffrey was not a fan of this idea initially and didn't want to leave Judy behind. However, he eventually conceded that her plan really was the only solution to their problem and got on the afternoon flight to Philadelphia alone. At 7.30 p.m. that night, Judy boarded another flight to Philadelphia, arriving at the Doubletree Hotel where they would be staying for the next couple of days at around 9.30. As an apology for her earlier mistake, she even brought Jeffrey flowers. According to him, he brushed the whole situation off immediately and was just happy that Judy was there. After grabbing some snacks, the two spent a quiet night in their room together and went to sleep to rest up for the following day. As previously mentioned, the next morning passed uneventfully. Jeffrey woke up first, headed down to take advantage of the hotel's complimentary breakfast, and then briefly returned to his and Judy's room to grab what he needed for the day. After telling Judy about the breakfast, they went over their plans for the day and agreed to meet back at the room later that afternoon. That evening, they were supposed to attend a cocktail party that was put on as part of the pharmaceutical conference. The event was scheduled to begin at 6 p.m., so they figured they would give themselves a bit of leeway and plan to meet at least 30 minutes beforehand. However, when Jeffrey returned to the hotel room at approximately 5.30 p.m. that afternoon, he was surprised to find that Judy was not there. Initially, he chalked this up to a miscommunication. Perhaps Judy had thought that they were supposed to meet at the cocktail party, or else had arrived at the hotel room early and had assumed that he had already gone there ahead of her. But when Jeffrey went down to the party and looked around, he couldn't find Judy anywhere. For roughly the next 45 minutes, Jeffrey began to walk between the hotel room and the cocktail party, each time hoping that he would find Judy in one of the two locations or somewhere on the journey between them. While Judy was usually very reliable and almost always on time, Jeffrey knew that there were certain circumstances under which she might have been late. The first thing that came to mind was that she had seen someone in a bad situation and had stopped to offer them help. This was entirely within Judy's character, not only as a healthcare professional, but just because of who she was as a person. Just the previous year, she had offered to help a total stranger on a flight that she was on after they suffered a healthcare crisis and became violently ill during the journey. That being said, while helping a stranger in need was totally within character for Judy, failing to reach out to say that she was running late was not. With each passing minute, Jeffrey became more and more worried, until finally, at approximately 6.15 p.m., he went to the hotel's concierge and informed them that his wife had not returned from her day of sightseeing. 
The hotel staff began calling hospitals, but could not find anyone matching Judy's description that had been admitted in the surrounding area. Within half an hour of notifying hotel staff of Judy's disappearance, Jeffrey hailed a taxi outside of the Doubletree, determined to try and retrace his wife's steps from that day as best as possible. Knowing that Judy had planned to travel on a bus route designed for tourists called the Philly Flash, he asked the cab driver to follow the entire route multiple times, going as slowly as possible in a desperate bid to see if he could somehow spot Judy. Jeffrey would later recall in an interview, quote, I had him drive it at about five miles an hour, drove him crazy with all the traffic behind us. I'm not sure what I expected to see, but that's what I did. When this tactic yielded no new information, Jeffrey returned to his hotel for another frantic search of the cocktail party and his room before deciding that the situation was now beyond his control. He then got a ride to a nearby police station where he told officers that Judy was missing and asked if there were any reports they might have received about her. They had not heard of anything and told him that it was too early to file a missing persons report. For the next several hours, Jeffrey was reportedly left to essentially try and figure out the situation on his own. He continued to bounce around between the hotel, local hospitals, and other police stations, perpetually hoping that someone would have some sort of concrete information concerning Judy's whereabouts. Each time, he left disappointed and even more worried. Jeffrey also called his daughter and stepchildren in Massachusetts, asking them to travel to his and Judy's home to check their two answering machines for any messages. If you're wondering about why they had multiple answering machines, it's because both Judy and Jeffrey had separate phone lines, likely because of Jeffrey's work as a lawyer. In any case, the answering machines were both checked, but neither yielded any helpful information. At around midnight, Jeffrey returned to one of the first police stations that he had visited that day, this time hoping that he could finally get a missing persons report filed. Once again, he was told by officers that it was too early, as it had not yet been 24 hours since Judy had gone missing. The best they could do, they said, was to have Jeffrey come back in the morning, because at least then it would have been 24 hours since he had actually seen his wife. Upon returning to his hotel again for a few sleepless hours, Jeffrey decided to try and make some use of the time he had, and was able to get in contact with Philadelphia Mayor Ed Rendell and State Representative John Purzell. Both men were speaking at the pharmaceutical conference, so Jeffrey decided to pull some strings to report the lack of help he'd received from local police in connection with Judy's disappearance. After that, Jeffrey returned to the police station to file the missing persons report at the 24-hour mark for when he had last seen Judy, as officers had previously suggested. While it's unclear what went on behind the scenes between the police and the politicians ahead of Jeffrey filing the report, he would later say that when he returned to the station that morning, the change in the demeanor of the police was obvious. One of the station's lieutenants reportedly supervised the officers who took the missing persons report, and Jeffrey overheard that a copy of the report was to be sent to the city's police commissioner. After Judy was officially reported missing, a search of her and Jeffrey's hotel room was conducted. Most of the things that she had brought with her on the trip were still there, aside from the few things that she would have likely taken with her for her day of sightseeing. This included her wallet, her diamond engagement ring, her silver wedding band, and approximately $200 in cash that Jeffrey believed she had on her when she had arrived at the hotel on April 9th. The clothes that she had worn on the 9th were also missing, as well as Judy's signature red backpack that she was known to take most places with her when she went out. While this was happening, a broader search effort was also started for Judy, and flyers announcing that she was missing were circulated throughout the city. Judy's children soon flew to Philadelphia to join this search effort, helping to pass these flyers out along with Jeffrey and traveling to any areas where they believed Judy might have been seen. Despite their initial apparent change in demeanor towards Judy's case, however, Jeffrey would later say that it wasn't long before he once again began to experience frustrations with the Philadelphia police. Almost immediately, he claimed, investigators began to turn the bulk of their attention towards two specific theories about his wife's disappearance. The first was that Judy had simply had some sort of midlife crisis and had gone missing voluntarily, possibly for the attention. 
The second was that Jeffrey himself was involved in the disappearance. As for the police's first theory, both Jeffrey and Judy's children flatly rejected this explanation. They said that the idea that Judy would have pulled this as some sort of stunt was not only insulting, but extremely out of character for her. They also pointed to the fact that it would be an extremely bizarre way to run away. Why, for instance, would she have chosen to abruptly take off in a city that she had never been in before and knew little about, as opposed to back home, where she could have made arrangements for her new life far more easily? Also, if the disappearance was voluntary, why hadn't she at least taken the bulk of the possessions she had brought with her on the trip, instead of apparently only taking what she needed for the day? This was particularly true when it came to money. While Jeffrey had stated that Judy likely had about $200 with her when she left the hotel that day, according to reports, a further $500 that Judy had brought with her had been left behind in the hotel room. As for the police's second theory, that of Jeffrey's involvement, both he and Judy's children denied that this could be the case once again. While Jeffrey said that he understood and expected some level of suspicion to be cast upon him, he said that his and Judy's marriage was a happy one and that he would never have done anything to hurt her. He also pointed out that he had been in and out of conference events all day during the time Judy disappeared. When detectives insisted on interviewing Judy's daughter, Amy, without Jeffrey present, she reiterated that she was not aware of any problems in her mother's relationship with Jeffrey and did not believe he could be responsible for her disappearance. She told them that Jeffrey was an honest man who, quote, wouldn't even cheat on his taxes. Despite repeated pleas from Jeffrey and Judy's family to place their focus elsewhere, in the days immediately following the disappearance, investigators reportedly only became more entrenched in their two original theories. In fact, their skepticism seemed to deepen even further, as they soon stated, they weren't even sure that Judy had ever traveled to Philadelphia in the first place. To support this theory, police pointed to the seemingly suspicious circumstances surrounding Judy and Jeffrey's original flight to Philadelphia, during which they had been forced to split up because Judy had forgotten her ID. From speaking with Judy's children, they had learned that she was an experienced traveler, one who had previously taken her kids to Europe and who had also once traveled to Thailand alone to visit the family of one of her patients. Police therefore theorized that Judy wasn't the kind of person who would have accidentally left her ID at home before a flight. Investigators also pointed to the fact that other than Jeffrey, who said that he had seen his wife after she came to their hotel on the night of April 9th, there were no confirmed sightings of Judy in Philadelphia prior to her disappearance. While strictly speaking this was true, Based on multiple reports we came across in our research, this is somewhat misleading. While there were no confirmed sightings of Judy upon her arrival in Philadelphia, there weren't really many ways that it would have been easy to do this under the circumstances. For starters, it was 1997, so detailed surveillance camera footage was a lot harder to come by. Judy also didn't really know anyone at the hotel where they were staying, and went missing before she would have been able to have been seen with Jeffrey at the cocktail party which, had she attended, would have likely produced more reliable sightings. According to reports, the Doubletree Hotel where Jeffrey and Judy were staying also didn't maintain a guest registry at this point in time, meaning that it was even harder to verify whether Judy had ever checked in. As for the whole situation with the ID in the airport, Jeffrey pointed out that the FAA policy requiring ID to board domestic flights had only been in effect for about 18 months at the time of the incident and Judy was by no means a frequent flyer. In fact, during that entire period, she had only been on one other flight, causing Jeffrey to believe that Judy forgetting her ID was simply an honest mistake. The idea that Judy was never in Philadelphia gets even less convincing, though, when you consider other reports that we came across stating that investigators later learned that someone using Judy's name had purchased a ticket for the 7.30 p.m. flight from Boston to Philadelphia on April 9th. These same reports state that the seat was confirmed to be occupied during this flight and that police were also able to recover a luggage tag from Judy's suitcase showing that she had boarded the flight. Finally, Though we stated that there were no confirmed sightings of Judy in Philadelphia, this isn't to say that there were no sightings of her at all. 
As more flyers were distributed, additional people were questioned, and Judy's disappearance was announced on TV. Many different reports made their way to police in the following days and weeks. While these reports are far too numerous to mention in totality, and are of varying credibility, we'll do our best to summarize the ones that we think are the most important or interesting. First, there were the handful of relatively innocuous reports that were mostly to be expected. These included other hotel guests who thought that they had seen Judy there, a hotel employee who believed that she had spoken to Judy when she asked where she could catch the Philly Flash bus, as well as a driver for this bus service who said that they thought they remembered picking up a woman matching Judy's description at a stop near the Doubletree Hotel in the early afternoon. Around this time, another person claimed to have witnessed Judy entering a Greyhound bus station in the same area, which was about a 10-minute walk from the hotel. It was speculated that Judy might have entered the station to use the bathroom. Interestingly, the station is also only a couple blocks south of Philadelphia's Chinatown. Jeffrey knew that Judy loved both Chinese and Thai food, and theorized that she might have gone to the station either before or after having lunch in this section of the city. However, when restaurant owners in the area were questioned, none of them could remember seeing Judy. While all of these early potential sightings seem possible, if not decently credible, things get decidedly more fuzzy from here. They also get a lot more strange. In particular, many of the people who claim to have seen Judy in the next few days following her disappearance reported her acting strangely, with her behavior ranging from confused to having some sort of mental health episode. A few people thought that they had seen Judy wandering around looking disoriented, while staff at another hotel in central Philadelphia claimed that she had stayed at their location from April 13th to 15th. They said that the guest that they had thought was Judy was particularly memorable because she had performed lewd acts in front of an open window, had spoken in tongues, and had claimed that, quote, the emperor would wire her money when she needed to extend her stay. The staff at this hotel had simply dubbed this woman their Weirdo of the Week, until seeing information about Judy and supposedly recognizing the resemblance. Finally, there was a homeless man who claimed that Judy had slept on a bench next to him in an area called Penn's Landing on the night of April 14th. When Judy's family members talked to the homeless man on the morning of the 15th, he claimed that they had just missed the woman he was talking about. Owing to the sheer number of these bizarre sightings in such a short period of time, both Jeffrey and Judy's children began to theorize that she had suffered some kind of brain injury or mental health crisis. In particular, they feared that she might be experiencing some sort of amnesia that was causing her to get confused and forget who and where she was. While this theory was not without merit, the family soon learned that there could be another, equally credible explanation for the numerous alleged sightings and the bizarre reported behavior. It turned out that there was a homeless woman in the area who bore a remarkable resemblance to Judy. So much so, that even her own son apparently mistook the woman for his mother when he saw her from across the street. The whole thing added an additional frustrating layer to the search causing police and family members to have to further question the credibility of any possible sightings. Take, for instance, the homeless man who claimed to have seen Judy in Penn's Landing. He was apparently shown photos of both Judy and the homeless woman who resembled her, but insisted that he had definitely seen Judy. This could be evidence that Judy was indeed acting strangely, or the man could have simply been mistaken. It was difficult to know what to make of any of it. And these were just the reported sightings of Judy Smith within Philadelphia. As time dragged on, police began to receive more and more reports of sightings from all over, all of which were nearly impossible to verify or disprove. By far the most interesting potential sighting worth exploring here is one involving a Macy's employee in Deptford, New Jersey. The employee said that she had interacted with a woman matching Judy's description at the Deptford Mall on the morning of April 11th. The employee said that the woman told her she was buying some clothes for her daughter, laughing and saying that her daughter often disliked the clothes that she bought for her. The employee also described the shopper as appearing disoriented and said that she witnessed her asking another young woman in the store to leave with her, apparently believing that they were her daughter 
or someone else that she knew. When Judy's family members heard of the Macy's employee's account, they found it to be highly credible. Judy's daughter not only said that her mother liked to shop at Macy's, but that the comment about her buying things that she didn't like sounded exactly like something Judy would say. However, most compelling of all was the description of Judy that the Macy's employee gave when recounting the incident. She was reportedly able to describe the clothes that Judy was believed to be wearing almost verbatim, right down to her signature red backpack. One other thing worth mentioning here is that the Deptford Mall is actually a short bus ride away from Philadelphia, just across the Delaware River. Based on the information we were able to find, Judy could have easily gotten there at the time on public transit, and it wouldn't have taken her much more than an hour. Despite all of the potential sightings, ultimately, these leads generated little to no concrete evidence for police and Judy's family members to go on. After several weeks of searching, even the unconfirmed sightings began to dry up, and Jeffrey and Judy's children were left with little choice but to return to Massachusetts. That being said, upon arriving back home, none of them were able to simply resume living their lives. Jeffrey, in particular, reportedly began cutting back his hours at the office because he could not focus on his work, choosing to spend his time instead trying to get the word out about his wife's disappearance and keep the story in the spotlight. To this end, he hired several private investigators to look into the case, and managed to get the story profiled on the show Unsolved Mysteries. He also faxed thousands of missing persons flyers to police departments and hospitals across the country, in the hopes of finding any news concerning Judy's whereabouts. Five months later, this tactic would finally yield a major development, though not in a way anyone initially could have imagined. On September 7, 1997, a man and his son deer hunting out of season in an area of North Carolina's Pisgah National Forest made a startling discovery. On a steep incline about a quarter mile from the Stony Fork picnic area, they found what appeared to be human bones. The bones had been scattered around an area about 300 feet in diameter, the result of what would later be determined to be animal scavenging activity. When police arrived at the scene, they were quickly able to determine that the bones were human, after a shallow grave was uncovered in the center of the area where the first remains had been found. In the grave was the rest of a partially buried, partially clothed human skeleton. When a medical examiner analyzed the remains, he determined that they belonged to a woman who was likely between the ages of 40 and 55, and who had extensive dental work and suffered from severe arthritis in one of her knees. The examiner further observed cutting marks on the woman's rib bones, as well as apparent cuts and punctures to some of the clothing she had been buried in. As a result, the case was declared a homicide, and it was theorized that the unknown woman had been the victim of a fatal stabbing. As for how long the body had been there, the medical examiner estimated it could have been anywhere from a few months to a couple of years. While authorities in North Carolina initially didn't know what to make of the case, it wasn't long before they received a call from someone who thought they might have a lead on the dead woman's identity. He was an emergency room doctor who had seen one of the missing persons flyers that Jeffrey Smith had circulated, and after connecting the detail of the arthritic knee in the flyer to local news reports about the skeletal remains, decided to bring it to the attention of authorities. Sure enough, when Judy's dental records were compared to those of the newly discovered remains, they were found to be a match. By the end of September of that year, it was announced that a positive identification had been made. This was the body of Judy Smith. Though Judy had now been definitively located, far from providing answers about her disappearance, the discovery of her remains only seemed to offer more perplexing questions. Chief among them, how had Judy ended up more than 600 miles away from where she was supposedly last seen alive? And under what circumstances? In order to try and make sense of the situation, investigators from Buncombe County, who took over the case after the identification of Judy's body, looked for clues among the number of additional items that were found at the gravesite. For starters, none of the clothes that Judy was thought to be wearing at the time of her disappearance were found at the site. Instead, she was found wearing jeans, thermal underwear, and hiking boots, all of which were appropriate pieces of clothing for the terrain and the time of year that Judy initially disappeared, 
for someone who would have been hiking in this area of the Pisgah National Forest. It seemed to suggest that she had dressed deliberately for the trip. A blue vinyl backpack was also found near the body, which reportedly contained winter clothes and $80 in cash. A further $87 was found in the pockets of a men's shirt, which was likewise found buried nearby. This was viewed as significant because at the time of Judy's disappearance, Jeffrey had estimated that she was carrying roughly $200 in cash, and none of her bank accounts or credit cards had been used since the time she went missing. Reports are a little unclear about Judy's jewelry, with some sources stating a bit of it was missing, though most of the reports we came across in our research say that the most expensive pieces, including her diamond engagement band and wedding ring, were found by police. The final item of note found at the scene, and included in most of the reports we came across, was a pair of relatively expensive sunglasses, which Judy's family said did not belong to her, and which she likely would not have purchased for herself. Notably absent from the scene, aside from Judy's original clothes, was her signature red backpack and her wallet, as well as any form of ID. Despite all of this information, Buncombe County investigators were able to draw very few, if any, solid conclusions about Judy's death. Because the case was ruled a homicide, they were obviously looking for another person who was involved in the case. Likely, the same person who had buried Judy and the items that she was found with at the gravesite. Based on the remote location, they also theorized that Judy was killed while she was already in the forest as carrying a body, as well as all of these items to where she was found, would have apparently been quite difficult. Finally, because of the presence of the money and the jewelry at the scene, investigators concluded that robbery was likely not the motive behind the killing. Still, these theories paled in comparison to the unanswered questions in the case. How had Judy made it hundreds of miles away from where she was last seen alive, especially without using her bank or credit cards, or the cash she had on her at the time. Had she been in trouble from the very start, either from foul play or else some kind of medical issue? Or had she initially disappeared willingly, only to run into a bad situation later on? And in any of the above situations, when had she actually made it to North Carolina, and how long had she been alive before she died? None of these questions seem to have a clear answer. Frustratingly, like much of the rest of this case, perhaps the only clues we have about Judy's final days also come in the form of unconfirmed sightings. The bulk of these sightings reportedly took place just days after the time of Judy's initial disappearance, and occurred in or around Asheville, North Carolina, a city in Buncombe County located a little over nine miles from where Judy's remains were eventually found. Again, these sightings run the gamut in terms of their strangeness, but there were two in particular worth mentioning. One witness recalled seeing Judy driving in a gray sedan filled with boxes and bags, and said that she had asked if she could camp for the night in her car. This reportedly happened near a campground close to where her remains were later found, though Judy apparently drove away after being told she couldn't camp there. The second sighting worth mentioning apparently occurred at a souvenir shop near Asheville sometime in the days following Judy's disappearance. There, a clerk recalled seeing and speaking with a woman who matched Judy's description. The clerk said that the woman seemed perfectly normal and alert, and said that there was nothing to indicate that she was not in her right mind. Most perplexing of all, during the conversation, the woman reportedly stated that her husband was an attorney from Boston that he was attending a conference in Philadelphia, and that she had just decided to visit the Asheville area. As for Jeffrey and the rest of Judy's family, they said that none of this information made sense when it was presented to them. They could come up with no reason why Judy would have traveled to North Carolina, nor were they aware of her ever previously expressing any desire to go there. Sadly, this is more or less where Judy's story drops off as it appears that the discovery of her remains in the fall of 1997 was the last major development in her case. That being said, before we wrap up, we wanted to go over a couple of theories in the case, ranging from the thoughts of investigators to one popular theory to a few thoughts of our own. Beginning with the official investigations, it appears that Philadelphia police and authorities in North Carolina were never on the same page about the Judy Smith case. 
Well, it seems that Buncombe County investigators were at least partially of the opinion that she had initially come to the Asheville area voluntarily. They were relatively quick to rule out any involvement of Jeffrey in the murder. Authorities in Philadelphia, however, never officially ruled Jeffrey out, despite the many people who corroborated his presence at the pharmaceutical conference on the day of Judy's disappearance. This is also in spite of another fact that we previously haven't mentioned, which is that Jeffrey Smith was morbidly obese at the time of the incident. This was apparently a factor in the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office ruling him out as a suspect. As aside from all of the other reasons previously mentioned, investigators did not believe Jeffrey would have been physically capable of getting Judy's body to where it was found. Regardless, beyond Jeffrey Smith, it seems that neither police department that investigated the crime ever came up with, or at least publicly named, another suspect in connection with the case. According to reports we came across in our research, Jeffrey Smith passed away sometime in 2005. Next, we should talk about alternative theories of the case that have been proposed over the years. And here, there was one that repeatedly popped up during our research into Judy's case. It involves convicted serial killer Gary Michael Hilton, who is sometimes referred to as the National Park Killer or the National Forest Killer. According to reports, Hilton committed at least four known murders between 2007 and 2008, all of which took place within national forests. Interestingly, two of Hilton's victims, retired couple John and Irene Bryant, disappeared while hiking through the Pisgah National Forest. Like Judy, Irene's body was reportedly found not far from the city of Asheville. That being said, these murders took place roughly 10 years after Judy was killed, and no actual evidence has ever been produced to show that Hilton was involved in her murder. Still, this remains a popular theory online, and if you look as deep as we did into Judy's case, you're bound to come across Hilton's name at least once. Finally, we turn to our own thoughts on the disappearance and murder of Judy Smith. Honestly, it's probably going to come as a disappointment to many of you, but despite doing hours of research for this video, it's difficult to know what to make of this case. Perhaps the strongest opinion we can muster about Judy's disappearance at this time is our conviction that Jeffrey Smith likely had nothing to do with his wife's murder. Throughout everything we read, we could find only one example of a person who had anything negative to say about Judy and Jeffrey's marriage at the time, a friend of Judy's named Carolyn Dickey. Dickey was interviewed as part of the televised segment that aired on Unsolved Mysteries, during which she stated that at the time of Judy's disappearance, her marriage with Jeffrey was, quote, very tenuous. However, Dickey is extremely vague about what she means here, only following up with, quote, I believe that something did happen that triggered her to want to have some time away from Jeff. While it could be true that Judy was looking for a way out of her marriage, it seems weird that Dickey would be the only person to know this, considering that as far as we can tell, none of Judy's other friends nor her own children came out and expressed this opinion. And even if Dickie is correct, it merely means that Judy may have wanted to leave Jeffrey, not that he had anything directly to do with her disappearance. Aside from the numerous people that claim they saw Jeffrey on the day of Judy's disappearance, the thing we keep coming back to is how Jeffrey acted afterwards. He immediately raised the alarm, went out searching for Judy, and tried to report her missing at the earliest time possible. Not only that, but when the immediate search for Judy was unsuccessful, Jeffrey hired a team of private investigators to try and draw more attention to the case. None of this seems like the actions of a guilty person. If you ask us, therefore, the crux of this case comes down to whether you believe Judy Smith left Philadelphia willingly for her own reasons on that mysterious April day back in 1997, or whether you believe that something else happened to her, that she was either taken against her will or was the unfortunate victim of some sort of mental health crisis that left her unable to find the help she needed before things took a dark turn. The unfortunate truth is that right now, we simply do not have enough information to know one way or the other. According to the few more recent reports we could find, Judy's case is still open in Buncombe County, though it's unclear whether detectives there are continuing to actively investigate it. Hopefully, someday soon, this baffling and terrifying mystery will be solved, 
and Judy's remaining family will finally get the closure that they deserve. Now that you've heard the whole story, though, what do you think? Is there anything you think we missed or left out? Let us know in the comments section below. While you're there, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our future releases. And as always, thank you for watching.